components and controls where he's applying his um, years of experience with uh, solar trackers to help reduce the cost of heliostats to achieve the DOE goal of $50 per square meter. So specific heliostat areas of his focus are the development of wireless communications, low cost controllers, and also low cost composite reflector faces. So uh, we, with this seminar, we aim to provide an overview of the current work in partnership with Caribou Labs to develop the wireless architecture specifically for heliostat fields. And with that, I would really like to thank uh, Dr. Matthew Muller to join us for this event. And uh, Matt, you can carry on. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm also working on this project with Hia Garabecha, which I believe he's online. Hia, I apologize, I just noticed a typo in your first name there. And then David McKelly from Caribou Labs. And uh, thank you for inviting us. You can go ahead and go to the second slide. So an outline of the things I'm going to cover, I'm going to go over an overview of solar power and concentrating solar power just to, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with these topics, give you a bit of background, um, get into wireless control to cut costs, why we need uh, wireless hardware specifically for heliostats, and then I'll give you an overview of our specific project and goals. I'll share with you Caribou Labs hardware our work this far in our project timeline. So you can go to the next slide. Okay, so here, you know, a lot of people that aren't familiar with research in solar will, will hear the term solar power and that can mean a lot of different things. Acronyms we use are PV, that's for photovoltaics, CPV, that's concentrating photovoltaics, and then CSP is concentrating solar power. So I have pictures of each of these here. In the upper left corner is, is, you know, standard solar panels or PV on a flat roof. The next picture over would be solar panels or PV on a two axis tracker. And then you continue to move over and the picture with the car in front of it, that's actually concentrating PV. It looks similar from the distance, but if you got up close to it, there are lenses that are focusing the sunlight on little, very small solar cells or PV cells, maybe on the order of uh, 10 millimeters or smaller. It depends on the system. And then to the farthest right in the top row, you have uh, solar panels or PV on a single axis tracker. That's actually the, the bulk of large installations in the United States. Uh, look what you like what you'd see to the far right there. But then on commercial rooftops and houses, you would think, see things to the far left. Then when you start talking concentrating solar power or CSP, you're talking about using mirrors. And then you have in the lower left, um, troughs, which are um, focusing um, the, the, the sunlight from the mirror on a tube. And I don't have control of the cursor, but uh, um, so I might, if you kind of point to that lower trough, there's a line that goes up, kind of looks like a line of copper. That's uh, go down a bit. Down a little, there you go. Along that line, there's, there's a tube in each trough and the light gets focused there. And then there's a, uh, um, a thermal fluid in there that will take that heat and you can use it as, as heat or you could use it also as uh, um, energy to, to, you know, steam to generate um, electricity. And then to the, to the lower right, you have uh, um, tower CSP. And in this case, you have thousands of heliostats, that's two axis trackers with mirrors, focusing the light on uh, the, the top of the tower and you can kind of see the rays going in. Would you go ahead and go to the next slide? So before uh, we go before, to the next slide, yeah. sorry, Matt, let's do Let the me... full screen mode. Uh, so, yeah. Wait. Give me a minute. Okay. Excellent. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. And by the way, if anyone wants to stop me along the way, I don't know how I'm not seeing participants. So if there's participants that have questions and want to unmute themselves and ask me questions as we go, I would prefer that. Um, but you can go to the again, this picture, these are pictures of all the different technologies. What we're talking about hereafter is is CSP. Again, I have cartoons of the two uh, pictures I just showed. 
Um, all CSP uses mirrors to concentrate the sunlight. Most systems also incorporate thermal storage to create dispatchable or baseload power that could compete with coal or natural gas. The bulk of installed CSP around the world is, is trough at this point, although China has a number of tower systems uh, in the pipeline right now. Um, again, trough is at 300 to 400 degrees C. Uh, power tower systems are the most expensive and they typically achieve temperatures near 600 C and then they run conventional steam turbines to generate electricity. We go to the next slide. So um, again, just kind of comparing a little more on CSP versus PV, um, the levelized cost of electricity uh, for CSP tower systems is about 10 cents a kilowatt hour right now. And the DOE goal is to get that to five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, the LCOE for PV is about three cents a kilowatt hour, but it doesn't include storage. If you want storage with PV right now, there are some systems going in with batteries, but that of course increases the cost. And generally speaking, if you put batteries in with the PV plant, it wouldn't have as many hours of thermal storage as you would from a, a CSP plant, which could produce power throughout the night um, after a good sunny day. Would you go ahead and go to the next slide? So I said DOE wants us to work in the next several years to cut the, the costs down to five cents a kilowatt hour. There's a number of ways this can be done. You can increase the plant efficiency. Um, this can be through the heliostat field efficiency, improve the quality of the mirrors, improve how well the heliostats track, and focus the light on the tower, on the receiver. Um, you, the receiver itself, you'd seen in the previous picture, all that overspill of bright light here, there's no light shining on it. So you see that it's, you know, a black surface. Um, but you can imagine it's super hot there. And so there's thermal losses there. So if you make the receiver more efficient, you have less losses, you cut costs. You can also move to higher temperatures. Um, if you use particle storage, you can use, move up to 700 C and that increases the efficiency. I've noted down here that Sandia has their G3, P3 project that is specifically in this area. And there's a link down there if you're interested in learning more about that work. Um, you can also work to achieve economies of scale through a steady flow of projects. Right now, what it's been is a project will go in and manufacturing has to ramp up to make all these heliostats. And then there's no project for a couple of years because of the, you know, the challenges of bringing the cost down. And it costs millions and millions of dollars to build one of these plants. So we don't really have ex economies of scale and a constant manufacturing right now. Um, you can reduce the heliostat field cost. That's what this work in wireless is focused on. And there's other areas. I'm not getting into all these details, but the bottom line is if, if you work in all these areas, it is doable to decrease the cost to five cents a, a, a kilowatt hour. Will you go ahead and move to the next slide? Okay, so getting more into the specifics of wireless control to cut the, the cost of a heliostat field. Um, a field of 50,000 heliostats can have a diameter of two kilometers. So that's massive amounts of wire and a lot of cost spent in, in, in your wiring. Heliostats can be powered by a small PV panel. So if you go wireless, there's no need for trenching and that cuts costs. The picture here is actually from the plant in Israel. It, um, it's called Ashalim. And you look at the, we're looking at the backside of, of the mirrors here and the upper center of the backside of the mirror, you see... Uh, radio communication, and then there's a little teeny solar panel behind that. That solar panel there is enough for the radio communication and to drive the motors of these heliostats. Um, so if you go this way, you reduce wiring costs, and the, the just, you don't need to disturb the field except for putting the, the pylons in the ground, and this can have significant reduction in environmental impacts and costs. This image is a wireless field, and this was developed by BrightSource. And it's proven successful, but it's proprietary technology. So not all fields are going in this way. And that's what this project is about, trying to bring wireless available to, to any heliostat manufacturer. Would you go to the next slide? So why the need uh, um, for wireless that's focused specifically on CSP? Um, take some of the other existing technologies. Uh, the Zigbee mesh network is, is cheap and it's used for PV trackers like I showed in those previous slides. But usually you have hundreds of trackers, not thousands of trackers like the case with the heliostat field. 
and the data transfer rates are too slow when you, you go up to these thousands of heliostats. Analog devices makes a, um, some, what's called the dust smart mesh network. It can provide field communication speeds in the order of five 10, to 10 seconds, but the speed is not ideal for auto calibration of heliostats. Faster speeds can also provide other opportunities for cost reductions. I've listed a few others here, LoRa, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and the sub one gigahertz uh, um, wireless technologies. None of these are optimized for heliostat fields. You gotta get into the specifics of each one, but depending on choice, you might have too low of data rates, too high of energy use, or it's too expensive for the targets for heliostats. So I'm working with Caribou Labs in this project and they're focusing on wireless hardware that includes everything, including the photovoltaic panel, the battery and all the connectors, the integrated circuit boards and an antenna, all for a cost of less than $30 per heliostat. So this can hit the targets we need. Uh, um, Dr. Uh, Arini on this, uh, you know, who is online as well, has a Heliocon project that's working on the integrated access and backhaul, backhaul technology to achieve, achieve similar goals but her project is focused on algorithm develop, not, not so much hardware. And this project's really focused on hardware. Um, hopefully we can have some synergies between the hardware in this project and her project. Will you go ahead and go to the next slide? So this is just my sort of general background uh, slide for this project. I'll kind of, most of this I've already said, but, but our, our milestones and deliverables, we're supposed to build a flexible wireless control test bed at NREL with a hundred communication nodes so that um, industry and academia can use this for testing. And also we're testing it within this project. We'll be public publishing all the cost benefit analysis, design documents, test results of this hardware. We'll also be incorporating wireless seminars like this into various CSP curriculum to try to you know, make more aware of this problem so you know, students and postdocs and people like that can get involved. We hope the project will have the impact of, um, you know, this test bed we're creating will be useful to others. We hope to achieve less than 50 millisecond communication speeds, and this will enable this closed loop and auto calibration type of control. Um, we hope to reduce by $10 a meter squared the controls cost. And then we also hope to enable small scale CSP plants. This is where you could use direct heat for industrial purposes. And if we can have more small scale plants, we could um, basically have a more steady manufacturing stream and work toward those economies of scale. You go ahead and go to the next slide. So getting into sort of the, the details of what Caribou is planning, um, first of all, it's asymmetric communication, um, what they call the HCUCC, the heliostat control unit communication controller is the end node on each heliostat. It's low cost, it's low power, it has uh, you know, weak uh, RF output. It, it's 20 dBm or less than about 0.1 watt. And again, the battery and small solar panel are on board. Um, the HCUCC will only be listening for messages from the software defined radio at the tower and select time periods to conserve energy. The central controller, what they're calling the TCU or tower control unit, it's more capable. It's a software defined radio. It will communicate with many of these HCUCCs at once. And it's a shifted frequency from the messages coming from the HCUCCs. Uh, it, transmit it transmits at 30 dBm. Um, generally groups of 20 heliostats will be targeted in a single message, but it has the flexibility to uh, increase that number if, if the message size is, is less. So that's kind of a rough number. 24 bits of the message are for the heliostat address. Um, the field's divided into subnetworks. The HCUCC only reads the header and ignores uh, the message if it's not for its address. Um, the end nodes or the HCUCCs will be communicating over a random frequency that's selected each time they need to send a message back to the um, SDR and that'll be in the 902 to 928 megahertz range. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So kind of jumping specifically into the hardware here, um, the Caribou Labs radio actually has capability at 915 megahertz and the 2.4 gigahertz ranges. 
Um, I described specifically what we're going to be doing at, at NREL will be in the, in the lower range. They've worked to a design that can be, um, you know, mass produced and it will be open source so others could produce it as needed. Um, the communication is expected to have a refresh rate of uh, greater than five hertz. Um, it should be able to communicate at ranges greater than one kilometer. Um, the over the air capabilities will enable uh, firmware over the air and cybersecurity uh, encryption and authentication are part of it. There's a link here and I'll have this later on to looking at the open source hardware that's already out there. Um, what you see in these pictures and the one in the, the lower um, center that you see in red, this is two boards together. The top board is actually the HCUCC. And then it, it plugs into the lower board, which is actually the board that controls charging of the from the PV uh, panel and then powering um, you know, the, the board above. And then the physical uh, device is actually what you see in that real picture to the, to the right. You can go to the next slide. Here's some more details about the board itself. I'm just gonna go over a few things. Obviously, you know, it has a power supply, but it has a USB a plug-in, so you can use that for programming or firmware updates or when, you, when you're doing testing with it. You got indication LEDs on how it's performing, that things are performing as expected. Um, it's got a spot for a GPS uh, receiver, but that's just a placeholder. We're not gonna be using it with the GPS receiver at this point. Um, you've got the MCU or your computing power there, um, right in that, in that central location where the chip is. Um, it's got storage, onboard storage. Um, it's got a connector for the antenna. And then it's got an accelerometer and, and gyro and so forth for it to help understand what's going on also with the heliostat. You can go ahead. It's also got a clock so that it can, you know, receive messages on a synchronized basis from the central control. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, this is just kind of showing the way the assembly is going to be for our project at NREL. What you see in here in yellow is, is just a printed uh, part to hold all the components within a small outdoor enclosure. So um, the battery slides in that slot to the left, the PCB stack slides in the middle, and then to the right, your antenna fits right in there. And it all can, of course, can plug together your uh, USB port is sticking up to the top. So if you need to get in the box and plug in, but then on top of this, there's a little, another little uh, um, printed piece of plastic in green that holds the little solar panel that snaps on the top. And then we're putting this all inside a, um, an outdoor enclosure. Again, you see the real components in the lower right where you see the size of the lithium ion battery and the little solar panel to go to the next slide. Okay, so we're installing a hundred of these at uh, our Flatirons campus. On to the right, you see the actual, you know, what we saw on the last side put in our small electrical enclosure. So right, this is something like six inches by five inches. So it's pretty small. We're just taking standard posts that you would use to make a fence. That you see that picture in the in the upper center, and we're pounding a hundred of these posts in the ground at our Flatirons campus, and we'll mount this little unit on top of the post. And then of course it's powered by the sun. We're gonna be spacing these about 10 to 30 meters apart. I'll show you some more details of that in a minute. And then up on the, uh, one of our MET towers, we'll be putting the uh, software defined radio up there. And we're probably gonna put two to test it at two different heights and do simulations at two different heights. And go to the next slide. So here is our Flatirons campus. What you're seeing, what the main thing you see here before we go into sort of the things that are drawn on it, we have a lot of uh, PV at, at this site, but we also, they're harder to see, but if you go at various locations, you can see uh, sort of brown circles at places. Um, go down to the, keep going down like that, follow the orange line down, now go over to the right and up a little bit there. That's a, that's a wind turbine. You're looking down on a wind turbine just above his cursor, and there's several others here on the site. So we have wind turbines on the site too. This is our primary site for doing wind testing. So we have a lot of MET towers for measuring wind speed and so forth. I labeled over to the upper left SDR. So somewhere right in that region, we've got a couple of towers there. We'll be mounting the SDR to one of those. And then what you see with all these circles are the, we've been marking the locations. We've, um, you start at the upper left there. We've got, a, um, there's the corners of an area there where we're putting in 
20 of these uh, posts in a more kind of, you know, dense packed area. I think we're at, um, we get 20 meters apart there. And then as we make this spacing, as you follow that curve, we're at 30 meters apart for posts. And then we get over to the middle of the picture where you see a six by six grid of uh, posts there. And we're at 10 meters apart for some of those. And then we again, create a trail of them over to this lower corner here where we've got a, another grid of a total of 20. And we get 950 meters from one end to the other, of course, the real thing is the distance from these to where the SDR is. And we don't have that. I don't have that marked exactly, but, but we're in the range of 900 meters of distance. So we're not the full extreme that these units can handle, but we're basically, we're giving these coordinates to um, Caribou Labs. They're going to run simulations on these. We're going to get the units in the field and we'll be able to collect field data to compare to their simulations. We go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, so getting into kind of our timeline of what's going on, we've got the 100 posts installed. We were trying to get that done before the ground froze. The first, we had hoped to have the first radio units at NREL by now, but it, uh, Caribou received some of the first units from the, uh, the Chinese uh, factory that was manufacturing them for them um, and was going to, they're going through a, a set of baseline testing before they shipped units to us. They found there was a problem with fake USB chips. And so they've replaced the chip on one unit and have it fully working, but they've also notified the factory that there was a problem with these fake chips and they're having to produce hundred new units for us. So that should, we expect to get them at NREL now in December. First, they're gonna still ship to Caribou. They will test them all before they send them to us. Um, in their testing, they found that the, the original PV cell they had chosen uh, wasn't quite optimum. So they changed that. Like I said, the unit's now fully working. Um, they're continuing on software development and we'll be working on the simulation in the coming months. And like I said, we should be getting the units in December and I expect we'll start uh, first bench top tested and row in January and then probably February we'll go mount them to those posts. Um, again, Caribou is simulating the performance for the layout I showed you. We'll have publications that follow reporting the comparison with the simulation results. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So the hardware testing to come, first of all, we're on the hook to demonstrate communication to all 100 nodes with azimuth and elevation commands for the heliostats being given. Again, there's no heliostats there, but we're gonna make sure that the nodes receive the commands and, and, and report back to the SDR. Um, and we have to prove a latency of less than 250 milliseconds over, uh, on average over 10 hours. Um, we need to demonstrate bulk communication of 200 through 300 kilobytes of data to all 100 nodes with a rate of greater than or equal to 25 kilobits per second per unit. Um, we need to demonstrate under jamming for 10 hours that the latency is less than 750 milliseconds while in closed loop control mode. We need to demonstrate a difference of no more than 25% when we um, compare the simulation emulation results to the actual field reported latency over a 10 hour period. Um, we need to demonstrate that under real field jamming, that the latency results are not worse than the emulated jamming. Um, for a range of 200 to 900, the 20 to 900 meters I've shown, we need to dem demonstrate a bit error rate of less than 10 to the negative five. We need to demonstrate password and encryption system are operational and we'll use an impersonator unit to attempt to send messages to the system with and without encryption. We'll then run the system continuously for I think a lot of next year, but the way it's reported in our metrics is greater than 60 days. And then we're gonna report the metrics as a function of different meteorological conditions and you know different events that go on at the site there. And go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, again, here is the link to you know the GitHub site for this hardware. Um, you know, I just put this up again if, if anyone wanted to get that. That's a, and this is just the, the you know the main page when you get there. You can go to the next slide. I think this is the last one. So I thank you for your time. I'm interested in discussion and questions, and my email address is there if anyone wants to get in touch with me later. Hi Matt. So uh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna read it out. Uh, okay. So it's it's the question is from Sky. Maybe he wanted to ask. Heliostat meters have uh, positioning motors that require significant electrical power. Mm -hmm. How are you avoiding wiring up these motors to electrical power? 
So when you go to something like, uh, I mean, if you want to go out of presentation mode so I can see the slide number you need to shoot to, that might be good now. Sure. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yeah. Okay. So when you go up to one of the pictures where I have one of the bright, the uh, number seven. So what's been done on Helios, that's like this. I mean, it, and if you want to zoom in, there, there's an azimuth motor that's right at the top of the um top of the pedestal and that's been sized you see there's actually a little motor sticking out the end of it there's a um, go down keep going down a little bit further below the the horizontal tube if you go in there there's a little uh, keep and now go to my right a bit <laughs> sorry yeah yeah right there your cursor was almost on it I mean, basically to move these, they don't have to move great distances. And what happens, that's the motor up there that's driving it. And it's really um, a very small stepper motor. It doesn't require much power. And basically the battery has been sized so it can generate enough power to make these movements at time. And then the same thing, there's a linear actuator just a little bit further above. In reality, to move these, you don't need that much power if you design it right. Um, for example, with this system, it's been designed that there's enough power in the battery to last with several days of no sunshine. And what happens when the battery is getting low, um, they move the system to, um, you know, in essence, east facing. So they're ready to go again when the sun comes up on the next day, the next time the sun is available. But the bottom line is, is you can size these these systems such and gear them appropriately so you don't need lots of, of power to run them. Does that answer the question? Okay, let's see if he responds in the chat. Um, okay. So meanwhile, we do have another question. Um, it says, how are you ensuring security and reliability since wireless communication is unreliable and vulnerable to uh, cyber attacks? And that's the part about we're going to be doing the jamming testing and we're going to be proving that the encryption is successful. I'm not necessarily the expert on that, but the caribou has a lot of experience with that. And, you know, in the project, we have to demonstrate that that uh, under the various conditions, we have to prove the reliability. But that's in our metrics. We do have to prove it in the, in the field testing we're going to do. And hence why we're going to attempt jamming and attempt to to break through, you know, the encryption. Okay, so there's one more question. Following from one of the previous questions, how will you simulate the power consumption of the motors during the trial? So we're not, in this particular case, we're not doing the, um, the heliostat side. I mean, what you, what you do now and, and everyone else who's been working on this, and you size the battery and the PV panel for the motor's consumption. And in the end, the battery um, is large enough that the, the radio's energy needs are insignificant compared to the, to the motor's needs. So like I said, you, you take the needs of the motors and you make sure you size the, the solar panel to that. For this particular unit in front of you, um, it is, I think, something like eight to 10 watt uh, panel. And that's sufficient. And the, the system has been operating and, and doing well. With no prop, really, with no problems. Um, again, on our part of the project, we're just trying to demonstrate that all the parameters of the wireless can work appropriately. That again, the reliability, the latency, the uh, security issues, but we're we're not having an actual heliostat place in place. And I'd say one of the biggest weaknesses of probably what we're doing is that the mirrors can actually be reflectors of the radio signal and cause issues as well. So we won't have the mirrors present in this study as, as well. It was, it's basically a pretty low budget study. So we would like to do that eventually, but that's not in, in this particular study. Uh, so there's one more question. How the system will behave in terms of time overhead for large scale commercial CSP fields? How can you guarantee that you can um, handle the interference well the, the the goal here is obviously we're not going to have fifty thousand units but the goal here is to prove that the simulation results are matching the field results and that will give some confidence that you can scale up you know to the fifty thousand units in your simulation and have some 
belief in your results. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons we tried to put, we have some uh, some of the uh, radios closely packed together, some further apart, and we try to get these distances. Um, but again, we didn't have the budget to do 50,000 radios. And we really don't have enough land space either. Okay. Um, so there's a there's another question. How are the mo mirror motors charged? Will they have a separate solar panel? No, in the end, you choose a panel that's big enough for the motors, and and at that size, it the the drain from the radios and the way we're designing them here is a very very small portion of that. So really, you size the PV panel for the energy draw over the course of the day of the motors. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think just to add to that, like through our project, the Heliocon project, we also tested this thing. Like if we kept the radio module turned on for let's say a week and there was no uh, like solar harvesting done in the last six days or so, we checked the energy level and it was never like to a point where there is a crisis or there's a need for more energy. So the PV panel should be able to support both the radio and the motor functions. I, I mean, if that's the general question that, that are being asked here. So, uh, okay, there's one more. Uh, is there any wireless heliostat field being built in USA currently? No, the, the field near Las Vegas was built brought by um, Bright Source, but that was their previous generation to this picture you see here. So they weren't ready to go wireless in, in the plant near Las, Las Vegas. And then when they built the, the next field was this plant in Ashalim. They are building some other, they're building a plant in South Africa right now. It's also wireless, but there's no plant being built right now in the United States. So how long do you think it would take? I mean, given we're working on such projects right now, is there any estimate or any year that we envision that by this time we're gonna have wireless heliostat fields in the states i envision the next time a project actually gets penciled to in in finance to be built that whoever that uh you know whoever manufactures the heliostats that they will go wireless um all the companies i've talked to want to do this um for example heliogen you know with their engineers were working on, on solutions on their end to go wireless if they got a, a plant to install. And I know others who also would, would wanna do the same thing. For example, there's another project that, that um, Solar Dynamics is working on using um, the dust network I mentioned. They believe that communication rate is sufficient for their heliostats and for their design. Our goal here was to build a system that's fast enough that it could work for anyone and so to to basically help you know people like solar dynamics heliogen to hopefully take some of that load off them at that if we demonstrated this is possible in hardware that it could be done that they would have to demonstrate uh, use less resources uh doing all their own testing and so forth but it, it i'm under the belief that the next field in the u.s when that gets funded will be wireless thanks yeah Okay, uh, there is uh, some couple of more questions. So uh, thank you so much for the superb info, but is Caribou Labs expanding to other countries or is planning to expand? Caribou Labs, again, the goal is to make this all open source. And, and of course, I think they want to, they're also working on a controller as well. And that their whole package would be something that, that you know, a heliostat manufacturer would be interested in and therefore and that they would hit the cost targets needed but again that we're making this they're making the radio um hardware open source so for example if heliogen wanted to they could take this and, and believed it was the appropriate thing for their heliostats then in the end the goal was that a company like heliogen could go to a third-party manufacturer whether that was in the us or china or wherever ask for these radios to be manufactured and should be able to hit the cost targets does that make sense Okay, uh, we'll, we'll see if the the one who asked that question replies to that 
uh, answer. So um, there's another, uh, yeah, so he said, makes perfect sense, thanks. Okay, uh, some of the, uh, so there's one more question from, so it says, what sort of maintenance schedule is required for this system? That is, how often do batteries need to be replaced? Do you just replace the entire box, including battery and electronics every 10 years or so? Um, I can't sp speak specifically to, you know, Caribou's hardware design. I can say that, that what you see in this picture here, um, that BrightSource designed it to, to last for the life of the plant. That's not to say that you wouldn't have some hardware fail and have to replace it. I would assume in the case of what we're working with, the hardware is so small that you would probably want to just drop a new unit in and, you know, have an external connector where you just plug it in. Um, I think that would be the cheapest thing than trying to actually troubleshoot that, that you had some chip go wrong on the board or something like that. It would just swap a new one in. But again, I spoke directly with engineers from BrightSource when I took this picture that was here when I visited that facility. And they said they, they sized the battery and a plan for the battery to last the life of the plant. Uh, as we know, we have our cell phone batteries and things like that fail. So I think that's an economic decision, whether you want a quality, a high enough quality of battery that you expect, um, you know, the number of charge cycles you have on that battery to last it as the life or whether you just, you know, want to swap this out. That battery, like I showed in a picture with the hardware is quite cheap. I've bought a battery like that to replace in my headset, you know, and it costs it dollar or something like that when when you buy them in bulk so also you could just be choosing to um to swap out batteries if you have battery issues mm, okay uh, uh one more question related to latency so latency is estimated to average less than 250 milliseconds mm -hmm. so what will the maximum latency be or i think what the person meant to ask is what is the maximum allowed latency for the functionalities that you are targeting? Um, you know, we're targeting to see really the bulk of the field be less than 500 milliseconds. Unfortunately, obviously, um, Caribou Labs is in a different time zone that didn't make sense for them to join this meeting, but I'd have to get, I'm, I'm, and if you want to email me that question, I'm happy to uh, um to email them and, and get an answer. Also, as we do publish results, as we, um, you know, do the field testing, we want, we're not just going to publish the, you know, the median or, or mean latency, we're going to publish the, you know, a histogram of, of what we see. So that will come in the publications and you'll probably get the best answer when we actually have field data. Hmm. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay, so there's one more question. Um, oh, it's from Rick uh, Rick Somers. So is this a point to multi-point type wireless topology? It's going to be, you know, the, the, the SDR to each, um, each subnet. So there's not, it's not mesh. It's not going to go, you know, no heliostats will be communicating with each other. Okay. Uh, are you aware if Caribou hardware design needs license to manufacture it, or is it completely open source? There's um, there's some information on those kind of details on the GitHub site. I am I'm not aware of the exact details there. Um, so you could look there, and I'm sure, and I can also ask Caribou and, and get a better answer to the, to that question too. They make a product called Caribou Light that you can go buy on on Mauser right now, for example. So it could also be that you know that they basically have it available through places like Mauser, and people just order the hardware through through you know through a mass electronics supplier like that. Okay. Um, another question from Sky again, just to confirm, each node has bidirectional communication, and it is not limited to slave mode only comms can any mirror node issue an unpolled alert or error message to the base station sdr so is is the question can any of these hcucc's communicate back to the central tower is that the question yeah i think so so specifically he wants to know like any mirror node 
being the wireless node basically okay issue can can it issue an unpolled alert or error message to the base station sdr yeah they should be able to send any type of message necessary like that they haven't gotten a communication that they've received the message from that or if their battery's low they can communicate that so they'll you know um of course they'll be communicating their position so any number of messages can can come from them and um in the in the design similar to what bright source has done if they don't the plans for heliostats when there's a controller if they don't um receive communication for some reason it's if there's a problem and they're not getting information from the central tower then they would go into a stow mode to, to make sure they're not causing any problem okay yeah so i think that was the uh, aim of the question to understand if each wireless node would have the bi-directional capabilities i mean it mm -hmm. receives updates from the base station and it is also able to send some packets back to the base station sdr so yes. yeah i think you answered that um i don't see uh, any other questions so uh let's let's see Okay, so everyone is thanking you for the wonderful talk. And it was actually very insightful, especially for us who are working on some of these projects uh, in order to establish or develop a wireless communication system in a heliostat field. So, uh, yeah. And one, one more thing just from my side, or, I mean, from our side personally, maybe. So uh, we currently want to uh, scale up to large heliostat fields and obviously that brings up many challenges um, and uh, other you know factors into it uh, but so far we have discussed about uh, the latency aspect of it but there are also security concerns vulnerabilities to cyber attacks so what will be what is the future of um, projects like that or um, you know like as you said the next time uh, a Heliosat field has funding, it will ensure that it has a wireless system. But will, will it also ensure, uh, will it also take into consideration all those security aspects and cyber vulnerabilities? I think the short answer is yes, it has to, because I don't think a bank will finance a project if they see perceived risk from a hacking. Um, now on the research side, as I think you're aware and I'm aware, we need to take this, you know, we need to first have these demonstrations that the hardware does, achieves the things we need, and then we need to dig even further into the uh, the security and safety. So I think there should be follow-on projects to go in even deeper in, in that area. Okay, and one more thing, since uh, we have um, audience from different backgrounds, and uh, um, what I'm trying to ask is if they ever want to, like, you know, participate in this, uh, you know, development of wireless communications. I, I believe there are many uh, fields in, in associated to that, not just developing the wireless communication systems or the modules, but also other hardware aspects or other um, field related stuff. So what are the opportunities for, um, you know, other people to, you know, participate in this and be able to contribute? Yeah, so the idea or the, you know, the what we envisioned in, in, in sort of putting in the proposal for this project would be we get this hardware in the ground and, and then others that would find it useful through hopefully seeing it in, in meetings like this would, it would imagine how they might be able to do some tests. And then they could come to us and say, hey, we see you got that hardware. We'd like to do this, this, and this test. And, and that's what we're there for. I do have the reality of, um, you know, within the government system, we'll get a project funded. And then if we don't have people come forth to want to use that hardware, the people who are in charge of that ground space I showed start mm -hmm. to say, wait a minute, why is your equipment sitting here and no one's using it? So it's, it's kind of like we use it or we lose it. And it's not that we would lose the equipment itself, but they'll make me pull my T-post out of the ground and then I'll need money to set it back up. So I'm hoping that we can entice people that, that this is useful equipment and, and people can dream up ways they want to work with us. And, and, you know, the goal is not for us to try to make money off this. The goal is that to help, you know, help CSP get to, to lower costs. So we hope uh, the Department of Energy and we know we want to support people who want to work with us. Mm. I see. 
and I hope I hope this equipment somehow will be useful to 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 your project. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So ideally, we are looking for equipments. I mean, wireless modules that can have uh, a, like a scope of programmability into it. Programmability in the sense of uh, be able to change its transmission power, be able to tune to different frequencies so that we can uh, work, we can mitigate the interference that is associated mm -hmm. to developing a wireless system in a heliostat field. So um, I do know you'll be able to program transmission power. Um, I, mm -hmm. I'm not power, I mean frequency. I'm not sure on these units and I have to ask Caribou that question, whether you can tune power at all. I mean, again, they try to go to a very low power mm -hmm. so to, to, to not use a lot of energy. But again, you saw the chip it has on board and, and the USB connection to be able to program that. So I'm, I'm optimistic that it that meets your needs, but we will have to get into more discussions on that, as you know. Yeah. So there's one more question right now. So a heliostat field uses lots of real estate. Are there any compatible uses for the land under the mirrors mounted on taller poles? Um, right now, a lot of the most of the fields have went into, um, you know, very desert like environments like you see in this picture. So there's not a lot of vegetation. And but there are st there is still an in um, you know environment living there. For example, um, in the plant near Las Vegas, they had to spend millions of dollars relocating uh, turtles. And if you don't, you know, if you, Sandia is actually working on sort of demonstrating that you know using the appropriate uh, techniques to put these in that you won't disturb the environment and you can leave. The, the wildlife, be it the turtles or whatever else lives there, living there without harm and that it might actually provide them with, you have to places that'll be a little bit cooler from shading from the mirrors that you might give them even improved habitat in some cases. But no fields that I'm aware of have went in, in um, locations, for example, where you have um, green growth underneath them. In that case, obviously you could have grazers and things like that, but, these plants have went in again where the DNI is very high and they're usually, you know, like I said, very desert like environments so far. Okay. So, um, yeah, there are some more uh, messages in the chat, but it's all about thanking you for the talk. Okay. And someone has also went as far to say humanity. Thanks, you too. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, um, I think Again, we, anyone can email me if you have further questions later and I'll do my best either to get the answers for you or if I have them, you know, provide them to you. And uh, I appreciate you guys setting this up. Yeah, yeah. It's it's also a privilege to have you in this uh, talk today. And I hope uh, the audience got to learn uh, some interesting things about heliostat fields and what the future lies in this industry and uh, how, uh, you know, there are opportunities that can be, you know, uh, looked into for those who want to work uh, in this field. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Matt, to, for, for, give, for, uh, for uh, joining this talk with us. And uh, this meeting is recorded. So if anyone like needs, we, we can send the meetings to all the participants here. And if anyone has any specific questions, uh, the email of Matt is uh, given in the chat and they can also reach out to us and we can forward the questions to Matt. So thank you so much. And uh, let's let's meet again sometime for another talk. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you so much, bye -bye. Matt.